considering hormone replacement therapy brings up a lot of fear. None of those fears are more important, in my opinion, than the risk of heart disease. There are some studies that show that there is an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, plaque development with HRT, especially for those over 10 years out from menopause. But there are other studies that show other trends, and there are so many factors to consider here. So while it's great to look at the literature, we really need to look at each individual person to understand what their individual risk is so we can make a decision around hormone replacement therapy. So I wanna walk you down our thought process around this critical piece of comprehensive bone health programs because when we're considering optimizing bone health, hormones has to be a part of that. If you're not taking HRT because you're over 10 years out from menopause or you're concerned about heart disease risk, please listen to this. So there's really three areas to consider when we talk about reducing risk of cardiovascular disease. Everybody thinks about cholesterol management, so I wanna talk about that. But there's two other things that I want you to consider. One would be boosting your body's nitric oxide production. I'll explain what that means and why it's important. And then also protecting what's called the endothelial glycal calyx. So this is something I'm gonna explain as well. It's a really important part of the arteries and how they function. I'm gonna talk about some specific products as well, and there's gonna be a discount code at the end. So if you're interested in this topic, please stick around for that. Okay, so let's talk about cholesterol out of the gate because everybody that just got interested in cardiovascular disease and health by listening to the first part of this is gonna ask about cholesterol. We talk about cholesterol all the time. Cholesterol levels go up when women go past menopause. It happens almost universally. Why? Because your body is screaming for more estrogen. Your cells want more estrogen. So as a result of that, your liver is producing the starting blocks, the foundational blocks of estrogen, which is cholesterol. It's a cholesterol-based molecule. And so cholesterol goes up very reliably. So then the question is, is, is that a problem? Is it going to provoke heart disease? Plenty of people would say yes. Plenty of people would say no. For us, we look at this as a possible risk factor. I think it would be a little irresponsible to say that it's not a risk factor at all, especially if someone is in the process of developing plaque, if they do have severe disease. I think we really do need to respect cholesterol. But I will tell you that for women, the literature is not particularly compelling that cholesterol is a major risk factor. There's many other more important risk factors to consider. So we consider it, again, as more of like a proxy biomarker. It's something that we look at. We do get lipid panels, but we're more interested in some of the things that you may not have heard of, like LP little a, ApoB, the actual particle size, oxidized LDL, CRP, homocysteine, fasting insulin levels, A1C, HOMA IR, and on and on and on. Those are actually better predictors of cardiovascular risk than is cholesterol. Many people aren't getting those biomarkers. But we can really paint a picture of cardiovascular risk with this plus imaging, and I'm gonna explain that in a little bit. Now, to drive this point home, I wanna review one meta-analysis that I pulled up recently. It's a 2016 study, uh, but it looks at 19 other studies that were looking at LDL cholesterol levels and mortality, specifically in the quote-unquote elderly. Now, this is what I tell my patients who are over, really over 60, definitely over 70, that are worried about their cholesterol. Because what we find, and this study shows it, what we find is that the lowest level of LDL was associated with the highest level of mortality and vice versa. So LDL in the elderly is protective or associated with lower mortality, probably because it's associated with better health overall. Now, these studies are challenging because when you have chronic diseases like cancer, for example, LDL levels will drop. If you are undernourished, LDL levels will drop. So I think there's a lot of confounding variables here. But I think what it does show, though, is that LDL cholesterol is not the quote unquote bad cholesterol we all need to fear for every reason in the world. LDL cholesterol is simply a biomarker that we need to understand in context of the individual. So for me, when I have a patient that's definitely over 70 with elevated cholesterol, I'm not very aggressive when it comes to managing cholesterol in that age group because I want their cholesterol levels to stay high. I want them to have all the building blocks that they need 
unless they have severe cardiovascular disease, and then potentially we're going to take a different route. But I'm much less aggressive in the older population than I am in a younger population. So in the end, we end up using imaging, and I've done other videos on this where we use a coronary calcium score or a coronary CT angiogram with clearly, and we really get a sense of what's happening in the arteries themselves. Beyond that, I'm not going to use cholesterol as a primary tool to help drive decision-making around what we're going to do. If somebody has severe disease, if they're developing disease, if it's gotten worse over time, yes. If they have very little disease or we're going to monitor this, we're going to let their cholesterol fly. So I think there's a middle ground here that we need to get comfortable with because cholesterol is a debatable biomarker. It is a controversial one because of the pharmaceutical side of this. I think it's one that we're going to see that if somebody is metabolically healthy, probably not a big factor, especially in the short term. The challenge is in the long term, if we're talking 10, 20, 30, 50 years, what does that mean? And should we be controlling cholesterol regardless? And that's a really difficult question to answer. But let's talk about these other two things that I mentioned. So we're going to talk about the arterial glycocalyx, and we're going to talk about nitric oxide for vascular health. So these are really, really important. Before we get into the details of these, remember that if you are struggling to put together your own bone health program, please consider coming to our masterclass. Masterclass is a totally free opportunity to hear me walk through how we put together a bone health program, all of the potential variables that can go into a bone health program. Uh, look for the link in the description on YouTube or visit us on optimalhumanhealth.com. Okay, so why are these two other things important here? Well, I mentioned that cholesterol is not the biggest concern for us when it comes to cardiovascular risk. But the thing is, when cholesterol does become a problem, when arteries are developing plaque, it's not because of the cholesterol. Cholesterol usually flows in and out of arteries and artery walls, and it's not an issue. It can be because these cholesterol particles are oxidized, and it can be because the artery walls themselves are dysfunctional. And this is the part I want to talk about. So there's really two major components here. So one is that the arteries require a significant amount of nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is something that the arteries, the cells that line the arteries can make, and it can break down. And it's going to make and break down nitric oxide in different levels based on different inputs. And then there's the lining of the artery. So the artery lining from a cell perspective is actually very similar to the gut. If you've heard of leaky gut, you can get leaky arteries. In fact, a lot of us probably have leaky arteries. And so those cells have similar tight junctions where they're held together and they want to keep the bad stuff out and let the good stuff in. And cholesterol, again, does pass through these walls and come back out. And that should happen naturally and not build up plaque. But when this layer gets dysfunctional, things get in there that shouldn't get in there, lights up the immune system, and that's where we start to have an issue. Additionally, there's a layer of kind of like mucus or sort of a sugar-coated layer called the glycocalyx that protects these cells. So it actually prevents a lot of the stuff from even getting to these endothelial cells uh, that are going to then protect the rest of the artery. So this glycocalyx is an important barrier that gets broken down over time under different circumstances. Now, these two things, nitric oxide and the glycocalyx, are also related, meaning that the uh, glycocalyx helps the endothelial cells to actually produce nitric oxide. So let's start with the glycocalyx. Let's start with a product called Arteriosil. Now, Arteriosil or Arteriosil HP is the only product that I'm aware of that actually has an impact on the glycocalyx. It features some unique ingredients that have things like a seaweed extract and some other things in them like grapeseed extract, green tea leaf extract, and a bunch of other things that have been shown in clinical studies to improve the glycocalyx. So I think this is pretty cool because I want my glycocalyx to work as well as it can. I know that I have some cardiovascular disease based off of imaging, so I want this layer to be as good as possible. All right, so now let's talk about nitric oxide. So nitric oxide can be increased by a couple of different things. So if you've heard of people taking products like super beets uh, or just consuming beets, these things have what's called nitrates in them. These are natural nitrates, not the synthetic ones. And they convert to nitrite in the stomach and in the saliva, and they can help create nitric oxide and that will then work its way into the endothelium. So this nitrate to nitrite pathway is a common way for like beets and other things. There's some supplements that use the similar pathway, the nitrate to nitrate pathway. But there is another option. 
So the other way to do this in the arteries is to actually support the enzyme ENOS in the endothelium. So this product that I'm going to talk about has things in it that will actually do it from the inside and last longer. The challenge I have with a lot of the beet derived things, the nitrate pathways are relatively short acting and I'm not sure they even work for everyone. Um, but either way, when you take a supplement like that or you're consuming beets, um, it's only going to work for either minutes to potentially hours, depending on what you're taking. Whereas if you're working directly on the endothelium, you can actually get coverage for 12 to 24 hours. All right, so the second product is called Vasconox. Vasconox or Vasconox HP supports nitric oxide production in the endothelium by providing some key vitamins and minerals. So for example, there's a little bit of potassium. There's some vitamin C, some D, some B12, some thiamine, some zinc, some magnesium. And these are things that of course you can get elsewhere, but they add them because you need them for the other components to be uh, effective. And so the other components are going to include kind of some like a proprietary mix of these things. So we'll just list them out here. So, so that's uh, beetroot, uh, black garlic extract, black currant extract, bilberry, raspberry, blue honeysuckle, blueberry extract. And what's cool is that they've studied this in house. And what they find is that um, at 24 hours, the increased nitric oxide production is still present and it's only come down by about 50%. So what's really cool is that in these studies, they were looking at blood pressure and the effect of nitric oxide and good functioning vessels as a reduction in blood pressure in those that are uh, that have high blood pressure. And so you could see impressive reductions in blood pressure by around 11 millimeters of mercury systolic and 11 diastolic, which if you know anything about blood pressure drugs, it's pretty good. What it tells us is that these herbs stacked together like this with these vitamins and minerals can have an impact on that enos enzyme in the endothelium and create nitric oxide so it's pretty cool so while vasconox can make nitric oxide another cool thing to consider here is what about the breakdown of nitric oxide now i've mentioned that the artery has the capacity to do both and it does there are some drugs that are very well known that help to reduce the breakdown of nitric oxide. And when I met with the, the company, Calroy, uh, one of the representatives, they told me that this supplement is used often with the drugs that block the breakdown of nitric oxide. And those are the drugs in the erectile dysfunction category like Cialis and Viagra. So Tadalafil or Cialis, when taken on a, the low dose, the five milligram dose on a daily regimen, helps to block the breakdown of nitric oxide. That's why it works for erectile function. That's why it works for um, improving vascular function elsewhere in the body. If you're using Vasconox, you're going to increase nitric oxide production. If you're using Tadalafil or Cialis, you're going to block nitric oxide breakdown. So now you can actually work on both sides of this equation. And this is a hack that we can use uh, when people are looking for improving blood flow, uh, if they have evidence of va vascular dysfunction. Um, it's a hack that can not actually be used in both men and women. There's data to support using it in both. So if you're considering using these, as I just said, they can actually lower blood pressure. So if you have high blood pressure, of course, please talk to your team before you throw these on, on your supplement stack. Um, you should always talk to your team before adding anything that I'm talking about because I'm only talking about general principles in the bone health world. But I think these are powerful tools because cardiovascular risk is such a big deal. Let's face it, we talk a lot about uh, hormone replacement therapy and breast cancer and other cancers, but really most women are going to die from cardiovascular disease. So this is the thing that we really need to be cognizant of. Now, you might be asking yourself, well, what are the downsides to a supplement like this? Well, truth is there doesn't seem to be much in the way of side effects. The biggest downside I would say is cost. They're not cheap supplements. Uh, we do have a discount code for you in the description, but they're not cheap supplements. And the issue is there's no biomarker that shows that they're doing what we think they're doing. We don't do biopsies of the endothelium to prove that the glycocalyx is thicker. We can't see it in blood. So how do we know? We don't know. We take these with a little bit of a leap of faith. I take them personally. Will I take them forever? I don't know, but I take them for now. And I'm gonna continue to monitor my progression of cardiovascular disease and plaque over time. And right now I'm not on any drugs for cholesterol. My cholesterol is relatively high. Um, 
I think that's okay, again, in the short term, but I'm monitoring. I understand what's happening with the imaging. So we're going to monitor that over time. So I hope you found that helpful. And if you want to consider adding these to your supplement stack, again, there's a link for a discount in the description on YouTube. Uh, if you're a HealthSpan Nation member, then you have access to that discount code uh, through the HealthSpan Nation uh, login area. If you're wondering what HealthSpan Nation is and you're looking for a community to improve your bone health, HealthSpan Nation is it. So HealthSpan Nation is our community where people are uplifting themselves and others, asking questions, sharing wins. It is such a great community. Uh, we have a weekly Zoom Q&A where we talk about you know, kind of topic driven questions. And then we have a content vault as well as discount codes like these for these products from Calroy. So uh, if you're looking for a support group for osteoporosis, consider joining HSN. You can learn more about that by clicking on the link in the description, or you can go to our website, optimalhumanhealth.com, and you can find information about it there. All right, guys, that's it. Remember that osteoporosis isn't the end, but deciding to reverse it is a beginning. I'll see you in the next video.